right. Good morning, church. You guys doing good? Uh, we missed you. Many of you guys were not around there in Thanksgiving, and we're so glad you're back. And some of you brought some friends, and we're glad you're here. Uh, don't forget, if you're a first-time guest here, and we, first of all, want to say thank you for being here. We hope you feel loved and encouraged. But the other thing is, make sure if you haven't already filled out a card, make sure you find somebody with a blue shirt or someone in the back. They'll make sure you get that card filled out because we have a special gift just for you. We want to give to you. Just say thank you for being here. Um, before we get started this morning in our new series, I just want to take a moment. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we got a, a bucket full of cards and notes. And I think I skipped past saying thank you. Uh, my wife and I sat at home with our girls around and we just read through those notes. And I can tell you, um, as a, a person who's committed to serving the church and loving on its people is encouragement to my heart to hear those words of encouragement. And so thank you so much for those who wrote cards and sent us messages. Thank you so much. Um, and as many of you know, um, we, uh, my wife and I, we lost uh, her, her daddy, Ed. Uh, it was a month ago yesterday. And so uh, yesterday was actually would have been his 71st birthday. And so we went over to Southern Maryland and hung out with his wife and extended families and celebrated that. Um, and uh, we just continue to pray for us as a family. We're walking through that, and uh, it's, not, um, it's not a one-and-done thing, and it is a daily thing. Uh, there's some days that are really good, and some days are a little rough. So especially continue to pray uh, for my bride. Dads are special. Uh, daddies are special, especially to little girls, right? And so uh, you, you daughters know no matter how old you get, your daddy's still special to you. So continue to pray for my bride. Um, as we walk through this. Um, let's go ahead and open it up in prayer and just uh, thank God for the word today. God, thank you in heaven, God, that you are so good to us. God, we get to talk about your word today. We get to be encouraged. We get to be challenged. And God, I just pray right now in the name that is above every name, your son Jesus, God, that your word will not return void as we're going to hear about today. It's, it's promise, God, that it brings light. It brings life. And God, I pray today it would penetrate our hearts and mind and do what it only can do. And that's to change a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, as you guys know, last week we ended a series called Here I Stand. And it's basically this big picture of the five solas on the Protestant Reformation and what that looks like for them and what it looks like for us today. And really the, the, four, uh, the core, core fundamentals of the gospel. So if you missed out on that, you can go to Spotswood LS. And look under media, you can find the sermons there. Or if you go to YouTube, you can type in Spots with Lady Smith and catch up. But we're starting a brand new series today. It's called The Light Has Come, as you saw a little bumper video just a second ago. And it's really leading us into Christmas Eve. And if you're uh, here today and you know about us, uh, there's a couple things I want to remind you of. One is this. It's just a little Have You Heard card. Uh, this is just a regular invite card. Please take some every week, invite new people. We're out in the community inviting constantly wherever we can uh, catch people or just engage them. And what I've noticed about Caroline County, and of course I'm new to the area, is people like to talk. And you just, you just engage them. They like to talk. And the good thing is I like to talk. So you got to give it a little time. You can't be in a rush. And so, uh, in fact, Matt and I were down here eating lunch this week, and we were engaging people, and I said, man, we got to give us some time. We ended up talking to a business owner for about 30 or 40 minutes. It was great. Uh, so make sure you're doing that. And the other thing is these are little, uh, the Light Has Come cards, and they have a little invite for uh, Christmas Eve. We're going to be doing two services, 9 and 1030. So make sure you grab some of those. We have about 400 in the back. We'll have a couple thousand next week. So we want to make sure we're picking them up and just going out and blitzing everywhere because we believe the light has come and we want to declare that light to, uh, to our community. So make sure you do that. Um, if you will, turn to uh, the Gospel of John, the book of John, if you have your Bibles. And by the way, if you don't have a Bible, we have free Bibles in the back. We would love to be an extra gift on top of what we give our first-time guests. Right over here to my right, to your left, if you're sitting down, uh, there are free Bibles back there. Please grab one. Uh, if you have a friend that needs a Bible, grab them. They're there for you. Uh, make sure you grab them. So John uh, chapter 1. This is where uh, we're really going to base our time in, the first five verses of the chapter, first chapter. But we're going to hit a lot of verses, so just realize that. Uh, um, I, I like to read a lot of scripture and sermons. I just feel like it's important. I don't have any wisdom of myself. 
Um, I'm gleaning off the scriptures and trying to do my best to explain them to you. And so just realize, um, if you don't like a lot of scripture read, you probably won't like my preaching because I use a lot of it, all right? Um, so uh, the big, big idea today, I wanna, want you to write this down. I always give you a big idea and a big question. This is the big idea. Uh, before the creation of the world, the Father's good plan for rescuing his children was to send Jesus to earth. Okay? So if you're taking notes, you can write that down. By the way, on the bulletin, we have that. and We also have some paper journals in the back. So let's start with verse 1, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life that was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, I want you to understand that when you look at this text, the very first verse says, in the beginning. Anybody who's familiar with the scriptures at all knows that sounds very familiar, doesn't it, right? Genesis 1-1, right? In the beginning. So I'm going to flip back there real quick. And I'm going to read the first two uh, verses in the beginning. You don't have to do that. I'm going to read it for you. But it says, Genesis 1, 1 and 2 says this, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. John, the writer of this book, and is identified as the disciple who Jesus loved, um, was very inter. Um, it was a first. It was a first-person account of the work of Jesus. And he wanted to declare very clearly on the front end, he gives us a lot of information in these first few verses. And he wanted to declare very clearly that when he talked about Jesus, he was talking about God. Okay? And so we see references to this in the very beginning. We see him say, in the beginning was the word, and then it changes from the word to he or him, meaning a person. And eventually, if you see, keep on reading down, we see him saying, that, that he came and dwelt among us. And we'll get into that in just a minute, what that all means. But this reality is when we're talking about the word, we're talking about him or he, we're talking about Jesus. So I want you to understand that from the very beginning. See, when you look at uh, Genesis chapter 1, you see the climax of God and his creation was human beings, Adam, Adam. And we see in this, this chapter of John, we see the climax of what John was trying to uh, to relate is this person of Jesus, what we, the scriptures call second Adam. He came to fulfill what Adam could not fulfill. So he fulfilled what Adam could not. But we see in here, we see in the beginning, we see that his word stands forever. And it will not return void. So in the beginning was the word, the word was before time. So how do I know that? If you look at Isaiah 40, 6 through 8, it says this. A voice cries, and I shall said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the, gra the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. So understanding the word is God, the word was God, and before time began is the word. Now, what else does it mean? It also means it will not return void. Isaiah 55, 10 through 11 says this. As, at, for as the rains and the snow come down from heaven and do not return, but, there, but water the earth, make it bring forth sprout, uh, sprout. And giving seed to the sower and uh, bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing that I sent it to do. In other words, God's word will not return void. God's purpose will be done. So his word was before, his word will last forever, and it will always do what God called it to do. See, the word is bringing into being the new creation, which God says, let there be light. 
So I want to over kind of do a, a four kind of a four part overview. First, I want to talk about Jesus and his existence. The second thing I want to talk about Jesus and his, his relationship with God. The other thing is I want to talk about Jesus and his identity. And also Jesus and his relationship with the world. And then I want to unpack what it means for Jesus to be the light of the world. So the first thing I want you to write down if you're writing and keeping notes is this. The time of his existence. We see in the beginning was the word. We see that eternally Jesus was pre-existing before anything. Okay, And we see this in that Jesus was God. And Jesus is God. John uh, 20, 31 says this, But these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That is really the theme and the purpose of this book, the book of John, is understanding that you may hear these things and believe them. Christ being salvation, I mean Jesus being salvation and Christ being the anointed one. Understanding that Jesus Christ is not his first and last name. It's that he is the Savior and he is the anointed one. He is the prophet, priest, and king. He is the one that all Old Testament pointed to and really is that one long narrative in Scripture and in the Word of God. We also see in Jude 125, it says this, To the only God, Savior, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So understanding that Jesus is eternal. He had no beginning. He has no ending. And he was before all the ages. 2 Timothy 1.9 says this, Who saves us and calls us to his holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, that which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So understanding that God is eternal. We also see the scriptures use this idea of the word or logos, okay? So, so what does it mean when we talk about words? We understand that words are a process of our will and mind, right? I mean, we're thinking about things, but they come out, and they're not us, but they represent us, right? And so understanding that it's this idea that when the scripture says the word was with God and the word was God, that in the full indwelling of Jesus Christ is God. In fact, you go on down farther, it says, he came and dwelt among us. That word, that representative, actually means the tabernacle. So when you look back in the Old Testament and you see a picture of the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God, you see Jesus. You see this, this, this picture of the presence of God, the exact representation of God. So this is when we see Jesus, the Word, the Word became flesh. This is not an abstract principle. It is the person and work of Jesus. So why Word? Well, I believe it's really a representative of God's Word and the complete and final Word of God. In other words, this is the whole purpose of the Word, was to send Jesus. So it's the final stamp, it's the final mark of history, sending Jesus. Uh, God in the form of Jesus to mankind to redeem him and rescue him. And now we get to par be a part of that process. We get to be a part of that work. See, we see in book uh, Revelation 19, we say this. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. And he goes on to say that he will defeat the enemy the sword, by the sword of his mouth, by the authority of his word, he will overcome them. So understand, when we talk about the word, we're talking about Jesus. Jesus being eternal. Jesus being pre-existent. And this authority he has over all. We also see his relationship with God. And it says the word was with God. Hebrews 1, 2 says this. But in these last days... He spoke to us by his son, son, whom he had appointed the heirs of all things, through whom also he created the world. So we see, we see God, we see Jesus with the Father. We understand this. Now, I want you to understand the Trinity is not something I think humanly we can fully grasp. Okay? It's divine. And so there's a mystery about it. But understand that Jesus is the second person in the Trinity. We see the Father, we see the Son, we see the Holy Spirit. 
They are all the same God, but they are each distinct. They all have different roles, but any action by any of the members of the Trinity is God's action, regardless who does it. So what we see is we see the Father sending the Son. We see the Son doing only what the Father tells him to do. And we see the Spirit being sent by the Son. Why? To do even greater things than he. So we see this beautiful marriage, this beautiful dance of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit working together. Okay? I love a saying that someone said that you know, even in a dance, someone has to lead, right? And so it's this beautiful picture of God uh, telling his son, you must do these things, the, f- the son obeying, the spirit being uh, given to us to, to give us power and strength to live out the gospel. So it's this beautiful dance that the Trinity does. And it says his relationship with God was with God. And then this identifies his identity. If you, if you will, Philippians 2, 6 through 8 says this, who? Though he was in the form of God, did not count an equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus Every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Listen, I want you to understand, when we talk about he, when we talk about the word, we're talking about Jesus, okay? We're talking about the very representation of God, God in the flesh. And as we talked about weeks ago, if we want to be more like the, the human that God created us to be, whether you're a man or a woman, okay? If you want to be more like that original human being that God created, you need to be more like Christ. The more you're like Christ, the more like you're being what God created you to be. And so our exact representation of God is Jesus. And to be made in the image of God is to be made in the image of Christ. So we are trying to emulate his life through the power of his Holy Spirit. And it says this, It goes on to say, all things were made through him. Now, I want to make it very clear, as I made it, I think, a week or two ago. Jesus was not made, okay? This is where Muslims, Jehovah Witnesses, even other brands of what they call Arianism. If you haven't heard that, it's just a term that basically means there was some ancient heresy that started in the 4th century, okay? And what happened was... This, this heresy was saying that Jesus was not God, he was not eternal, he was not uh, eternally begotten, but rather he was created. And he was the first, if you will, of creation. I, dis- I discussed this a few uh, weeks ago as well. And the highest, as you will, the highest form of angels. Or, as Arians would say, there, he wa- um, there, was, uh, sorry, there was when he was not. In other words, that somehow he was the first one that God created. But the scriptures make it very clear in verse 3 that without him, nothing was made that was made. You can't make something, I mean, you can't be made and then somehow be a part of everything that was made because therefore you didn't make yourself, right? So the very scriptures make it very clear that that's inaccurate, okay? But you will see, again, many Muslims, Jehovah Witnesses, others possibly try to spread that. So be aware of that and understand the scriptures very clearly. And it says, in him was life. And see, John 3.16 is probably one of the most famous verses, right? And we know this, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This life shines. It shines. Now, you know what I totally forgot to do this morning? I forgot to use my flashlight. Will you, will you turn the lights out back there real quick for me? Thank you. Real quick. Okay. It's a little different, but this is a little better, isn't it? I can see everybody's face real good now. Okay. All right. Now, you can go ahead and turn those back on so everybody doesn't freak out. All right. Uh, by the way, on, on Christmas Eve, we're going to have everything blacked out, and we're going to do actually a candlelight service in the morning. How cool is that? So you guys pray that we uh, doing something a little different, so make sure you invite your friends and family. But uh, this, this reality is that light shines, right? In fact, 
when you look at the benefits of light, I was, I was, as I was doing research for this and studying it, I said, what, what is the benefits of like sunlight, right? So these are benefits of just light, daylight, right? You, you get better brain power. You actually increase brain power. That's a good thing, okay? You get better blood circulation. You actually decrease your blood pressure. Okay, I guess unless you're at work, and that could increase there. So uh, you, you decrease your cholesterol. Uh, you increase muscle mass, bone density. Your immune system goes up. It helps your skin as long as it's not too much. It increases your oxygen. It actually kills bad bacteria. So when we talk about light, especially when we talk about maybe the sunlight, right, there's a lot of health benefits from the sunlight. On the other hand, when we talk about darkness, right, because the, the, the Bible makes it very clear there's a big contrast between darkness and lightness. I think everybody understands that, right? But when we talk about darkness, isn't it amazing that in darkness, things that in light were not an issue now become an issue in darkness? Let me give you an example. We live on about, uh, about 1.3, uh, about uh, almost 2 acres, okay, about 1.8 acres. And we've got a little yard, and it's got a it's got bunch of trees in it, a bunch of oak trees. Um, and my girls have a trampoline, and they've got a little uh, tree house and a little play area, and they love being in the yard. They absolutely love it, okay? Sticks, acorns, they just go at it, right? It's a blast. But if I ask them to go outside at night, even if it's just to, the, just to the van, which is only like 10 feet away, what do they ask for Daddy to do? They ask for me to go outside and watch them. Why? Because darkness puts something over us, right? It, it, it does something to our psyche. It, it causes us to not be able to see clearly, right? And so, therefore, we feel like we're in danger. In fact, I would tell you that in darkness, there's a lot of danger, right? That's probably when most crimes are committed. That's when a lot of accidents happen. I mean, think about it. There's so many things that happen at night in the dark that's dangerous. In fact, um, I will tell you, there's been many times, I, work, I, work on a, 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 I live on a very busy road, and there's been people who have r ridden their bikes, which is crazy in the dark, and walked in the dark, and it, it, there's been some scary moments where I've almost hit them. Why? Because I cannot see them because they're in the dark, right? I have a, a kind of a humorous story. Um, this is a long time ago, but when I was at Liberty University, um, there was some internship opening. So I interviewed for one and ended up uh, going to work at a church in Kansas for the summer. But before I went to Kansas in Wichita, um, they invited me to come out and be a part of like kind of a D now, Discipleship Now. It's kind of a youth weekend. So they flew me out in April and I went out there, was really building relationships with students and leaders, wanted to get to know everybody before the summer. It was great. It was a lot of fun. We went and did all kinds of cool things that weekend and God's word was preached. Kids got saved. It was cool. But one of the games we did was capture the flag. Now, I don't know who had this bright idea, but we did it at night, okay? And uh, we had this big piece of property. It was really cool. Uh, and it had these big, wide dirt roads in it. And they gave you the, the rules, right? You know, here's the rules. You got so many people. And you have the big flags you got to capture, but you also had little flags on you. If somebody grabbed your flag, almost like flag football, then you're out, right? And so then you had to go on the other side. You were captured. And the whole goal is to capture each other's flag. The first one to do it wins. And so somehow they had the roads kind of lit up, right? So they had the roads kind of lit up, and the rule was stay on the roads, right? Don't go in the woods because it's dark in the woods. Somebody's going to get hurt, okay? Well, I got kind of pinned down and uh, kind of broke the rules a little bit. And I started kind of thinking, I'll just kind of bend through the woods. Well, next thing you know, people started coming out of everywhere. And so that point, I just started running through the woods, right? And at that point, they were getting really close, and I turned back, and at the last minute, I turned back around, and all of a sudden, whack, this big old branch that I did not see, and I'm flat on my back with a big old cut across my forehead, right? So the reality is this. First of all, don't walk in the woods in the dark, okay? <laughs> Definitely don't run in the woods in the dark without a flashlight or a headlamp. Because the reality is this, we get very confused in darkness, and there's lots of things that can trip us up in the darkness, right? And the reality is many of us are not just walking in darkness. Many times we find ourselves running in the darkness, and we can get hurt. 
and we can be devastated. In fact, when you look at when you go back to the beginning in the Genesis, when you talk about the earth, it talked about it being formless, and it talked about it being dark, and it talked about it being void. Literally, that's who we are before we come to Christ. We are confused, we are without light, and we are empty. And I can tell you that was me. That was me. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ, can I tell you there's good news. God wants to fill you. He wants to give you purpose. He wants to, he wants to give you a, a, a desire that can only be filled by him. Just know that. So understand that in this reality, when we talk about darkness and light, there's a big contrast. When, lightness, when light shows up, what does darkness have to do? It has to flee. It, it wins every time. As long as I got batteries in this light and I turn it on, anywhere I go in the dark, it will shine the way. And the Bible says the word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so the word of God is living and active and able to, to mold us and shape us into God's image. So understand when we talk about light, we're talking about the word of God. We're talking about Jesus himself, and he wants us to walk in the light. This is the reality I want you to understand, too, is there, is, there are no hidden secrets with God. There aren't. We think we can be behind closed doors, or we can be in a remote place, or we're somewhere private that no one can see. But the reality is God sees it all. How do I know that? <laughs> Let's read Psalm 139. It says this. I say to you, if I say, surely the darkness shall overcome me, and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Scripture also says, and I think it's in Psalms, it says, a man's way is a full view of the Lord, and he examines all his paths. See, the reality, if we're here this morning, even in our own minds, if, if we were to take one person and say, well, I'd do pretty good, but if for some reason we were to print all your thoughts out on a big, big sheet and download them to a computer and print them out and plaster them on the walls in here, I don't think any of us would be necessarily proud of every one of those thoughts, would we? Okay? So the reality is even if we find ourselves thinking we're walking in a light, there's even things in our head sometimes that we dwell on and think on that can be destructive in our life. So even these things we need to overcome with light. The reality is darkness does not overcome the light. Light always wins. Before the light, it was formless, dark, and void. But when we accept the light, we're given purpose, we're given light, and we're filled with the Holy Spirit. So we're, that's what Christ wants us to do. Now, understanding this, that when we find ourselves in dark places, we really have one but a few little choices to make. One, we can repent, okay? The Bible makes it very clear, 1 John 1, 9, if we repent of our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all righteousness. Psalm 32 says it like this, blessed is the one who transgresses, transgressions is forgiven, whose sins is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as uh, by the heat of the summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. I don't know about you, but the Bible makes it very clear to understand, to, to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Okay, Understanding this. You were, not carry, you were not made to carry that burden of sin. Christ came to bear it for you. Listen, all of us in this room, the Bible says, have all fallen short of God's glory. There's nobody in this room who, who has arrived. I promise you, and it's not the guy sitting, standing up on the stage. I promise you, okay? We all have struggles in life. We can all find ourselves being tempted by the darkness. 
understanding that the Bible makes it very clear a, a part of understanding abiding in Christ is this idea of confession. Confession first to God and also finding accountability people that you confess your sins to that make you consistently walking in Christ. Now, I will tell you this. I've experienced it even in my own life. There's times as Christians, so the first is this idea of repentance, understanding if you come to faith in Christ, the Bible says if you repent of your sins, he is faithful and just forgive your sins. That means that he will give you his spirit, and that means you're born again. Anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone and new has come. But the second thing I want you to understand is Christians, sometimes we can find ourselves being tempted by darkness, even walking in darkness, and then all of a sudden we have a dilemma. We call ourselves a Christian, we're professing Christianity, but then we find ourselves dabbling in darkness. And all of a sudden, we say, well, we can't confess, because if we confess, then, then, then somebody's going to think less of me, or somehow I'm going to look in, in worse light. Can I tell you something? That's a lie from the enemy. Because any believer who's walking in grace and truth, and you confess that sin, they will rejoice with you. They should not condemn you. Look at Jesus. Jesus, the woman, the woman caught in adultery. Did, did he pick up a stone? He says, whoever's here without sin cast the first stone, and every one of them walked away. Understanding this, if we're not careful as Christians, we can find ourselves claiming to Christ, and then all of a sudden we start coming, and what happens is the, really the hooks of the enemy begin to hook in us saying, Oh, they're going to they're gonna down you. They're going to shame you. They're going to they're, they're gonna judge you. But that's a lie, okay? Understanding this, this is how Satan works. Let me read you a verse. John 10, 10 says this. The thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. But listen, Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. That's why Jesus came. You know, we were just talking with our girls yesterday before we left, and uh um, you know, I work with students for many, many years, okay? And so because of that, I kind of feel like I have a little bit more insight, just students in general, what they face and the, the battles that they've over the years. And what I've learned is this. Technology is a great thing, and there's a lot of good about it, but there's also some real dangers. And I have two little precious girls, and I want to keep them as little girls as long as possible. Okay. And so my research has showed and in, in what we've studied, and Michelle and I have talked about this for, for months, is that you know the average age of a kid now seeing pornography is about seven or eight. Okay. So you need to understand if you're a parent in here, okay, I believe it's our biblical responsibility to teach our kids about sex and sexuality. Okay. Also believe it's our responsibility to do everything we can to educate them and get them to understand that there are clearly good things in this world and there are clearly dangers in this world, okay? And so Michelle and I have read, did a bunch of research. We've read a bunch. And what we've realized is whoever introduces your kids to this the first time are in the driver's seat, okay? And guess what? We want to be in the driver's seat. So we bought a little book. It's called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures. And Michelle started it with hope several months back, but we decided we needed to really start it with both of them, so we kind of restarted it, and we just read through that, and we just basically described what um, a good picture looks like. We went through a photo album and all that things and celebrated it, and then we went through uh, this idea of understanding, kind of letting our girls kind of understand what pornography is, and it's basically people that have little or no clothes on it and that type of thing, and we just kind of walked through that, okay? And I know some of you guys are thinking, what? It's eight or nine? I'm telling you, okay? Kids are seeing these things. Even if you've got everything locked down, they have friends. They have other places they can get to. And what I try to describe to our girls is because our girls love to go fishing with Daddy. Okay, I love to go fishing when I have a chance. And they have all understand the whole, the whole concept of fishing, right? They understand how the, the cast, they understand the hook, the line, the bait, all that, right? So, in fact, it was funny because years ago, they wouldn't even touch a fish. Now, they're wanting to get their hands on the fish and the worms and everything. So, I try to describe to them that we have an enemy of our soul. His name is Satan. And he's come to kill, steal, and destroy. And he's trying to do everything he can to destroy the image of God, which we're made in the very image of God. Right? And, of course, that's, I believe, the attack not only on the marriage, not only on babies that are unborn, but also on pornography. 
because God created sex, and he created it for our enjoyment, and he created it for us to have and be sacred, and Satan's doing everything he can to wreck it, okay? So we talked about this idea that when a hook, we put bait on it, we throw it out, right? And the reason we throw it out like that, to fool the fish, so we can get the fish hooked. And I tried to describe to them and understand that there are things out there that anyone wants to try to hook you in. And he'll make it look good. And then once he's got your hook in, he'll try to reel you in. And so we talked about that on a very basic level, a very kid, children's level. But I believe with all my heart, if we don't equip our kids, just like many times we're not equipping our kids and when they go off to college, they just fall flat on the face. Because they have not been challenged in their faith. They do not understand how to defend their faith. They don't know what they believe. Okay? So it's very important as we as believers that we really get serious about this. Can I tell you, it's an epidemic in our society. And so understanding when we talk about darkness and lightness, talking about walking in the light, we have to be open and honest about these things. In fact, it talks about this idea of when, when we live these two lives, these hooks can get in us. In fact, if you read Romans 1, the Bible says when people continue to, to worship the created, over the create, creator and do not give glory to God, okay, that basically God will turn them over to their sin. He will turn them over, okay? So let me, let me read literally what it says. Romans 1, it says this, for though although we knew God, I'm sorry, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in their lust of their hearts to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creator, rather, I'm sorry, the created verse to the creator who is blessed forever. So understand this, there's a time where I believe if we continue to walk in sin, and 1 John talks about this too, where if we continue to walk in sin, I think God's going to turn us over our sin. Well, some will say, well, did they lose their salvation? This is what I would say what Scripture says about this. If you continue to walk in sin with no repentance in your heart, I'm not sure if you're saved, okay? So it's this idea of understanding when we walk, there, if we're Christians and we call our, we're, that we're born again and we have God's spirit dwelling in us, when we sin, there should be a, there should be a gut-wrenching thing in our heart, Rather, no matter what it is. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to do everything perfect. That's not what it's talking about. That's by grace we're saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. But understanding when we walk and we abide in him, there should be a grieving of our heart when we get angry with somebody, okay, or when we, we blow it up, right, or, or when... Uh, we have a thought that's just not of God, or we have some type of action, right? I mean, it should hurt our hearts. Now, it may not happen right away, but it's going to happen within time, and God is Holy Spirit is pulling us back to repentance. So understanding when God is calling us to light, he wants us to walk in the light. He wants us to abide in him. John 10 talks about this idea of abiding in him. Now, listen. So what does it mean when in this text, Jesus is called the light of the world? I believe the light of the world doesn't mean that he's removing all the darkness as he walks through the, through the world. This is what I believe it means. I believe it means four things. Let me tell you what that means right now. It's this. First is that Jesus being the light of the world means that the world has no other light than him. Okay? Jesus is our only hope, guys. It's not the government, okay? It's not, a, it's not another job with a pay increase or better benefits, okay? It's not that dream home or car, okay? It's not even America, okay? As much as Amer I love America, right? And I love uh, the things that it offers us. It's a beautiful thing. But I promise you, our hope needs to be in Jesus. He is our only hope because we're all going to pass away from this world, and the only hope we have is Jesus the second thing I believe it means is this, that all of the world and everyone in it needs Jesus as their light, okay? Needs Jesus as their light. In other words, as I said earlier, we're all broken. 
See, some of you guys in here, you're in a relationship, and you're trying to get that person to fix you. Can I tell you something? It doesn't work like that. They cannot fix you. I promise you. Men, stop trying to fix your wives, okay? Wives, stop trying to fix your husbands. Boyfriends, stop trying to fix your girlfriend. Girlfriends, stop trying to fix your boyfriends. It's not going to happen, okay? If anything, get down on your knees and pray because God's the only one that can fix the brokenness in each other. That's it, okay? So understand that Jesus is the only one that can fix this brokenness, and we all need it. And by the way, okay, probably the best way to fix the other one is actually working on yourself, okay? So that usually helps a lot more than pointing out someone else's faults. Uh, the third thing I believe it means is this, that the world was made for this light. See, this light is not foreign. This light is the owner of the world. When this light comes, it not only makes sin plain and shows that it's foreign and ugly, it also makes everything good in the world shine in its full true beauty. This world was made to be illuminated by the light of Christ. The light of Christ is native to this world. We talked about this the very first week we talked about. We're on our mission and vision. The understanding that God was coming to restore his kingdom here on earth. The gospel literally means good news, and it always signifies in the Old Testament a coming of a king, right? And the victory of a king. And understanding that God is going to restore God's space and man's space together, okay, for eternity. In fact, when you read this, this is where you get the understanding. And when Jesus says they will be cast into outer darkness, Literally where it says where there's no light. In other words, they're going to be outside the kingdom of God where there's complete darkness, where there's welling and gnashing of teeth, grinding of teeth, because there's going to be no light for them. Think about that. And that literally brings me to the last point where it says Jesus being the light of the world means that one day this world will be filled with his light. Before I ask you the big question this morning, I want you to understand there's a, a distinct, distinguished difference between darkness and lightness. Dark and light. Do you understand? There is no in-between. <laughs> you're either in the light or you're either in darkness. Okay? You're either in Christ or you're not. Okay? And I want to give you the opportunity this morning we're going to have a couple folks up front in just a few minutes as we sing a song. And if you want to give your life to Christ, if you want to walk in light, th these couples will be down here for you. They want to love on you. They want to pray with you. They want to encourage you. We want to celebrate what God's doing. And can I tell you something? Rick Nicely can't do that. None of our leaders can do that. Only the power of the Holy Spirit can do that. What I encourage you today, God is working your heart. Maybe you're a believer and you found yourself being attracted to the dark, dabbling in the dark, you want to repent your sins. Hey, come find me. Come find another leader. We want to encourage you. God wants to forgive you and rescue you and allow you to abide and walk in the light. Will you stand?